Okay, this is History 1302. This is Lecture 2. Uh, this is about reactions to the new order. In Lecture 1, we talked about a new order that was uh, happening in uh, the South, most uh, specifically from an economic standpoint. Uh, and what we're going to deal with in Lecture 2 here is some of the reaction to that new economic order. Uh, now, if we were in class, I could show, I could uh, play some of the music of Billie Holiday, but for uh, copyright reasons, we can't do that on a video uh, that's going up on YouTube. So I've got the uh, the lyrics to Billie Holiday's Strange Fruits, Strange Fruit on the screen. Uh, and I want you to be, I want you to look at these uh, lyrics for a couple of seconds while I'm talking here. Uh, and I want you to think about them while we uh, discuss uh, this first reaction uh, to the new economic order in the South, because there's a couple of ways people can react to these types of massive jarring changes uh, in their lives. One way uh, is through political organization and political activism. Uh, and the first thing that we're going to look at uh, is kind of the exact opposite of that. We're going to be looking at a lack of political activity, but more of a violent reaction to it. And uh, this is one of those moments where I need to give you a little bit of a disclaimer. What you're going to see following the lyrics here on the screen are some pretty violent and grotesque and horrific images of one of the worst circumstances uh, in American history, the process of lynching. Uh, we tend to have a lot of misconceptions about lynching in the United States. I'm going to do my best to try to get rid of those misconceptions, to, uh, to discuss where they come from, to talk about uh, what the realities are here. Uh, but the one thing that I absolutely will not do, and this is true uh, over all of the lectures that we get through uh, over the course of this semester, one thing I absolutely will not do is sugarcoat United States history. I don't think it serves any purpose, uh, any good purpose to actually sugarcoat and pretend things that didn't happen. Uh, pretend things didn't happen, or to pretend that they didn't happen in the way that they actually happened. When we talk about things uh, like justice and social justice and uh, and healing from things like racial issues, uh, one of the only ways to heal uh, is to absolutely be truthful about what happened, uh, as opposed to pretend it didn't happen. So uh, that's why I'm not sugarcoating this. This is why you're going to see uh, some of these images. So uh, again, just a disclaimer, the images you're going to see uh, are in a lot of ways horrific. And I think one of the worst things about these images uh, is that historians know a ton about the, is the issue of lynching. We know a lot of the specific details about lynchings uh, because a lot, I shouldn't say a lot of it, it was virtually always done uh, out in the open. We have this idea, and here's where we're going to start seeing uh, some of these images. Uh, we have this idea that lynching was something that was not particularly commonplace, uh, that it was uh, that it was done in under cover of darkness, that we don't know very much about the people involved, and yet we do actually know a lot about the people that were involved. We, uh, for example, uh, people took photographs uh, of the action, the things that were happening here. Uh, the image you see here is the after effect of four unknown men who have been lynched uh, in the state of Mississippi in the 1890s. This next image uh, is an image that belies the idea of what lynching actually was. Lynching was an incredibly, sorry, uh, an incredibly violent process uh, that involved much more uh, than simply hanging. The typical thing that people think of when they see hang, uh, when they think of lynching is hanging. But this particular man uh, that's on the screen here is a person who was lynched by, uh, there was a hanging involved, but he was also mauled by dogs uh, before the hanging actually took place. Uh, the next image that we're going to see here is an, an image of three men who were lynched in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, after being accused of a sexual assault and rape, uh, these three men that you, that were uh, that were lynched, uh, this is particular. This is commonplace uh, in terms of why the lynching actually occurred. Uh, but what I think is unique about this is again we have this idea of lynching as being a particularly southern institution uh, or a southern problem, if you will, and it's not. Duluth, Minnesota, is about as quote not south. 
as you can get. Lynching happened all across the United States uh, during this particular era. The next image we have is a man named uh, George Meadows, who was lynched in Alabama on January 15th, 1889. Quite often, uh, historians know not only the date of the people who were lynched, uh, of the date that the lynching took place, but we know the names of the people uh, who were actually lynched uh, over the course of this stuff. We see here another image. Uh, this is a man in the center named Lynch Shaw, who is uh, being posed uh, in 1936 with the men who carried out uh, his lynching. Uh, why I've included this image here is, is, again, we have this idea of lynching as something that was being done in secret, that people hid from all of this stuff, that the people who were carrying this out ran, from, uh, ran for cover after all of this. But again, this image suggests exactly the opposite. The people who were doing this stuff did not hide from it. They posed with their victims. They took photographs of the victims. They held them up almost as if uh, they were trophies to be presented to the public. Uh, this image uh, is a man in Littlefield, Kentucky, who was lynched in September of 1913. Uh, where he's been lynched, this is the important uh, part of this particular lynching is where he was actually lynched. A lot of times, apologists for lynchings argue that this was something that was done uh, as a sort of informal law enforcement, that vigilantes were stepping in and taking care of things that needed to be done where law enforcement wouldn't. Well, that's actually not accurate. Lynch, uh, this particular uh, man was lynched right out in front uh, of the courthouse uh, in Littlefield, Kentucky. So what we see is that these are people who are carrying out lynchings uh, as a sort of counter to the criminal justice process. They're suggesting that the criminal justice process will not be followed and we're going to take matters into our own hands. This next image is from uh, 1935 in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida. The person who's been lynched here is a man named Reuben Stacy. And I think what's remarkable to, uh, about this photograph, uh, there are this set of photographs, and I'm sure some of you are thinking this uh, as you watch this, is that these are, this isn't just a man who's been lynched. These are people who look like they're out on an outing to come out and look at what's happened. Uh, these are uh, people who have brought their children with them. So if you want to know how uh, this sort of stuff gets ingrained in society, we'll bring your children to these sorts of things. Uh, what I do not expect people to just kind of know uh, inherently about something like this is that this lynching uh, is actually some, a group of people uh, who are coming to view the body uh, after a day of having either gone to church or these are people who are on the way to church. It's more likely that they're on their way home from church. Uh, and the reason we can see this is it's Florida. It's 1935. Uh, there isn't widespread air conditioning. So the way the people are dressed in linen and in white and the boater caps uh, and all of that stuff suggests that this was done on a Sunday and that these people were on their after church outing. This next image uh, is the lynching of a, uh, a man in the very center uh, of, the, of the picture, uh, the lynching of a man named Jesse Washington. Uh, and we're going to talk more about Jesse Washington's lynching uh, in a little bit. But what's remarkable, again, uh, this is not something that's happening with just a couple of people under cover of darkness. There are literally, uh, you can see in the picture, literally hundreds of people. But this attracted a crowd of thousands of people to uh, this particular lynching. Uh, and the way the lynching actually occurred uh, was the victim, uh, in this case, was not hanged. He was uh, put, uh, he was hoisted over a fire uh, after being doused in oil, and then he was slowly lowered onto the actual fire. This next image we have uh, is the, uh, is a collage of sorts. The image in the foreground uh, is a group of men who wound up lynching a guy named John Littlefield uh, outside, just outside of Marietta, Georgia, in a place called Ellisville. Uh, and there is a headline from a newspaper uh, at the top of the collage. Uh, and I think, again, the language is what's remarkable here. Uh, John Hartfield will be lynched by Ellisville mob 
at five o'clock this afternoon. This is being advertised in the newspaper. This is not something, again, it's not happening under cover of darkness. It's not happening in secret. This isn't the newspaper simply reporting what happened. This is the newspaper telling people this is going to happen. There's nothing secretive about this. There's nothing quiet about what's happening uh, with lynching. Uh, this next image that we're looking at here is a woman who was lynched in Oklahoma in 1911. Uh, the, uh, the reason I've included this one, uh, there were not a ton of lynchings of women during this particular era, uh, but a lot of women did actually try to go in uh, and argue in place of their husbands uh, or fathers. Uh, they tried to argue things uh, like sharecropping debts or interest rate debts for the Basic reason that a lot of people in the Victorian era believed uh, that men gave women uh, some sort of courtesy that they didn't give other men, that they looked at women as the weaker sex that needed to be protected and the like. So a lot of women went to make these arguments uh, before groups uh, that were owed money, thinking that they would actually be safe from the lynch mobs that their husbands were not going to be safe from. Again, this image suggests otherwise, that these uh, people who are challenging the status quo in the South are going to be attacked. Uh, once again, to uh, see how differently uh, we, uh, we approach the process of lynching or the thought of lynching, uh, again, we have this idea that it was done quietly, that it was done under cover of darkness, in secret. But people took post pictures. They made postcards out of those pictures. This uh, next one that we've got on the screen here, uh, the front is a charred corpse uh, that of a person who had been lynched. And it says on the back of the photograph, it was been, it's been turned into a postcard. And it says, quote, this is the barbecue we had last night. My picture is to the left with a cross over it, your son, Joe. People were not particularly worried about being found out about this stuff. Uh, this is practically an advertisement uh, for the validity of lynching. This is a uh, card that was sold uh, in apothecaries and drugstores uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, it depicts the scene of a lynching of five men in Sabine County, Texas. Uh, you can see the, the caption, uh, June 15th, 1908. Uh, and it, there's a poem attached to this, this placard. Uh, the poem is a poem called The Dogwood Tree, and it is a poem that flat out uh, talks about why it's legitimate to lynch uh, African Americans. I absolutely will not read the poem aloud, uh, but you can read the poem uh, and be personally disgusted uh, in your own place here. Uh, but again, this suggests just how commonplace and how, uh, how openly this sort of stuff was done. This next particular image is a newspaper report of a lynching near Montgomery, Alabama in September of 1900. Uh, and what it depicts in the story uh, is the story of a lynch mob battering down a jailhouse door to take out a victim uh, so that the mob could actually go out and lynch him so, uh, to, and kill him. So the point of this is, the reason I've got this in, in this particular set here, is that we've got law enforcement actually working. It's doing the job. It's doing, quote unquote, what it's supposed to uh, if this person was, in fact, a criminal. And yet, these people are not going to wait for the justice system to play out. They're not going to wait for the legal processes to play out. They're just going to take matters into their own hands and go out and lynch him. Uh, and the reason I'm kind of uh, hesitant to say that this is about uh, law and order and crime and punishment and the like are statistics that we're going to see uh, later on here uh, when we talk uh, about uh, a woman named Ida B. Wells. This next image that you see is the photograph of a man named William Brown in Douglas County, Nebraska, with his lynchers. Uh, once again, we've got people who are posing with the corpse uh, who are not particularly fearful of what they've done. They're not fearful of being found out. Uh, there's a very large gathering of people uh, who are either involved or celebrating what's happened. This next image is Ida B. Wells. Uh, she was the person uh, who did the first comprehensive study on lynchings uh, in the United States, and her findings 
uh, became very, uh, very important uh, in terms of not only what we actually know about lynchings, but about how uh, how African Americans themselves responded to the process of lynchings. Uh, all right, if any of you have actually turned away uh, from all of this stuff, uh, that was the last photograph we're going to be dealing with here. Uh, so if you can come back to the the lecture here, uh, the issue of lynching is one that despite what we talk about uh, in our history, lynching is a commonplace occurrence in this period that we're talking about uh, for American history. It didn't occur only in the South. As I mentioned, it occurred throughout the entire country at the time uh, that Ida B. Wells' study was, taken, uh, was undertaken. Uh, there were 48 states and literally every single state uh, had had a lynching of some form or another. Uh, between 1889 and 1918, uh, which was the first, uh, which covered uh, the uh, first part of Ida B. Wells' study, uh, along with subsequent updates, uh, 3,224 lynchings uh, happened in the United States, 2,520, uh, I'm sorry, 2,552 were African Americans. The, uh, the numbers here, I'm not going to, again, test you on numbers. Uh, I want you to see the broadness of this process. Uh, the overwhelming numbers, obviously, were African Americans, and the overwhelming numbers of those African Americans were males as well. This process was a morbid and violent process. It did not simply mean hanging, as I mentioned before. As you could see from the images that I showed you here just a couple of minutes ago, lynching involved burnings, it involved torture, it also frequently uh, involved castrations. Crowds that came to the lynchings often numbered in the thousands. Onlookers would do things like fire rifles and handguns uh, into the corpses and into the air uh, in celebration. People cheered, children wound up watching all of this stuff. Corpses were often dismembered at the end of the, uh, of the lynching, uh, and body parts of the victims were kept uh, as a sort of gruesome keepsake uh, to the event. On top of all of this, railroads actually ran excursions to the lynchings. This is how uh, these crowds got to be so big at these lynchings. And the largest crowd, uh, for what it's worth, to attend a single lynching was about 20,000 people. And there were actually tickets being sold now to that lynching. Now, I want you to think about this, not from the standpoint of how many people were there or to be going, oh my God, it was 20,000. That's huge. I mean, that's all awful. But think about the planning that would have to go into such, such a venture to not only have a victim in place, but to put together an excursion with a railroad company so that these people are going to be brought in to the process to print tickets, to sell tickets, to arrange a time so that all of these people are there so that they can actually see what's actually happening. The amount of forethought and planning that goes into this is absolutely unbelievable. Crowd moods were often exuberant at these things. Uh, and as I mentioned, the sad part of this for many historians, myself included, is that historians know it because it was done completely out in the open. For a lot of people, there's a comparative here that I really don't like to make because I don't like to make Nazi comparatives. I think they're too simple a lot of times. But the Nazis committed a tremendous amount of atrocities and horror uh, in, in, their, uh, in their rule in Germany. But even with doing a lot of that stuff, they tried to hide what they were doing. They did not actually allow the rest of the world to see what they were doing. They talked about what they were doing. For example, Adolf Hitler talked about all of the stuff that he was going to do if he was in power. But in terms of the process and what they actually did, Nazi Germany hid the bulk of that stuff. The worst of what they were doing did not get exposed until after they were out of power, after Germany had been liberated from the Nazi rule. But here in the United States, when it comes to lynching, it was done wide open. People took photographs, they made postcards, they advertised, they put it in the newspapers. All of this stuff was wide 
out in the open. There's no dispute about what happened. The question is not what happened, but the question is how do we explain what happened? How do we say this is how it happened? And I'm going to tell you, unfortunately, that there really isn't a good answer. You're not going to uh, walk away from this lecture going, oh, well, I get it. This, this makes perfect sense here. Many of the apologists for lynchings, and there are plenty of apologists, claimed that lynchings were done as a punishment for crime, especially uh, sexual assaults and rapes, that this was something that law enforcement simply didn't have the capabilities to handle or wouldn't handle, or all sorts of uh, rationales are thrown into all of this. But when Ida B. Wells did that study that I mentioned a few minutes ago, what she found, or one of the things she found, is that in less than one third of the cases of lynchings, remember, she identified more than 3,000 cases, in less than one third of the cases, was there even an accusation of a crime, let alone a conviction? Okay, so there is no question. This is not a, an issue of law enforcement failing or law enforcement not doing the job or law enforcement being stretched too thin or anything like that. This is a matter of crime and punishment didn't really play an active role in all of this. What was discovered throughout all of this was that the overwhelming majority of the lynchings involved sharecroppers and people who were disputing interest rates or the debt that they owed. So it's mo far more economically oriented than it is crime and punishment. Now, to give you an example of one of these, uh, one of the uh, worst lynchings uh, on record is the case of a, a man named Sam Hose in Florida. Uh, Sam Hose was a farmer uh, and a laborer who worked in a town that was very near uh, the Florida and Georgia border. He was uh, ultimately uh, lynched, dismembered, and his knuckles displayed as a warning uh, when he had got, gone in to dispute some of the wages that he was owed uh, with one of the people who was employing him. Uh, he got into an argument with the employer. He basically said to the lawyer, the, uh, his employer that he was going to get his money one way or the other, which the employer took as a threat. Uh, Hose decided that his best option was to simply leave town. So he got on a train and tried to get out of town. Uh, however, his employer wound up uh, actually getting killed. Uh, and it was incredibly poor timing. Uh, there was no no trial or no evidence presented that Sam Hose had actually done this. It was simply a matter of people had heard the employer and Hose arguing. So they went to the train station, they found Sam Hose, they pulled him off of the train, and then they ki he was killed in front of a crowd of onlookers of more than 2,000 people, including people who had actually come across from Georgia to participate in the process. When it was done, as I mentioned, he was hanged dismembered and his knuckles were displayed on the posts of the company store that he worked for. The, his knuckles were displayed as a warning that this is what could happen to you if you do the same thing that Sam Hose had actually done. Now, I mentioned uh, the case of a man named Jesse Washington. Uh, we're going to come to that now. Uh, Washington was lynched in 1897. Uh, he was from Waco, Texas. He was a sharecropper. Uh, as I mentioned, he was immersed in oil. He was hoisted over a fire uh, or hoisted onto a tree and then lowered over a fire. Uh, what was unique about this situation was that the State Department actually tried to get involved because the United States was arguing with Spain over Cuba at this time and was really pressing Spain on things like human rights violations. And the Secretary of State tried to get involved in these sorts of things, telling, for example, the Texas governor that if you try to, if you do stuff like this, it makes it very difficult for the State Department to do what we're doing abroad. So please get a grip on these things. Please stop doing these things. Do everything in your power to stop them. And the governor of the state of Texas at the time simply said, well, you know, this is basically none of your, I'm paraphrasing, this is none of your business. And, you know, we're not going to do anything to stop this because this is uh, essentially a, an issue for local law enforcement. Now, probably the most important case from a structural standpoint, the most important lynching case uh, from a structural standpoint, uh, occurred in 1906 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. 
uh, in the, uh, the circumstance of a man named Ed Johnson. Johnson was arrested by Hamilton County sheriffs uh, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, for a sexual assault. He was ultimately uh, brought to court, brought to trial uh, for that sexual assault. He was convicted uh, and sentenced to death. Uh, so there was no, uh, from a legal perspective, I'm not talking about just, you know, from the trial or the social issue that was going on. But from a legal perspective, his guilt had been established. Uh, according to the laws of Tennessee, uh, he was to be sentenced to death. But despite that death sentence, uh, and despite the legal process playing out, uh, mobs attempted to lynch Johnson on two separate occasions. Now, what drove their anger was that Johnson decided that he was going to appeal his conviction and obviously his death sentence and his rationale for appeal was that he had not been given proper representation uh, or given a fair trial so uh, he appealed and literally on the same day that the supreme court actually agreed to hear his case a mob successfully broke johnson out of the hamilton county uh, jail they dragged him out to a river uh, or excuse me to a bridge outside of town uh, and then they put a rope over his neck and threw him off of the bridge uh, with the idea that the torque would actually break his neck. It didn't. The torque didn't work. The rope actually broke. And Johnson fell to the riverbanks below, broke his legs in the process. Not to be deterred, the mob actually went down, got Johnson, brought him back up to the top of the bridge and reinforced the rope, threw him over the bridge a second time. This time it worked. Uh, and then not content with that, uh, the uh, onlookers fired uh, shots into him uh, on multiple, uh, they fired multiple rounds into him. Uh, and Johnson is dead. This moved the Supreme Court to actually get involved. Remember, the Supreme Court had actually agreed to hear Ed Johnson's appeal. So they looked at this, <clears throat> excuse me, and said that justice had been obstructed. So for the only time in American history, the Supreme Court actually convened a criminal trial. That's not what they typically do. They hear appeals courts cases. However, since they had already agreed to hear Johnson's case, the crime in this case, in this circumstance, was stopping, obstructing the, the actual appeal process. So they convene this criminal trial. And who they wind up bringing in uh, for uh, for criminal charges are the sheriff of Hamilton County and two of his deputies a uh, in a Supreme Court case called the United States versus ship in this case these two the sheriff and two of his deputies in Hamilton County were actually found guilty of contempt of court uh, in not uh, in not supporting the Supreme Court's actions in actually hindering the Supreme Court's actions. And they get they wind up getting sentenced to a, a completely meaningless uh, jail term. They get sentenced to 60 days in jail. Now, that's not really the big issue here. Whites are actually being punished in the Ed Johnson lynching case, but that's not the big takeaway from all of this stuff. The big takeaway is that the courts had established here in the Ed Johnson case that lynching simply could not just be done without an answer to the courts, that lynching is more than likely an obstruction of justice, that it can be punished. And this is a really important thing. This gave courts across the country a legal ability, a legal precedent to go after people who carried out lynchings. Now, unfortunately, the American courts do not do this. They don't follow up on this, uh, on this precedent. But the precedent had been handed to them. It had been given to them. Now, given that nobody did anything, that the courts did not follow up on this, that other courts didn't agree to hear cases about obstruction of justice when it came to lynchings, this is what led Ida B. Wells to carry out her famous study. Now, her study was done in a very simple way. She's inspired to go out and figure out what and find what she can about lynchings. And she decided she's going to use simply newspaper accounts. She's going to go from town to town across the South. Uh, she's going to put herself in incredible amounts of harm. She's ultimately uh, going to need bodyguards and the like to 
get through the part of these parts of the South. Uh, and what she's going to do, she's going to go to libraries. She's going to ask to see their newspaper rooms. And then she's just going to sit there and pour through the newspapers and find every single case of lynchings that she can. It's in these newspaper accounts that when she read the accounts of the lynchings and saw what people were lynching, being lynched for, she discovered these people were not being lynched over crime and punishment. These people are being lynched over sharecropping disputes and interest rate disputes. 70% of the lynchings, I'm going to say that again, 70% of the lynchings involved no accusation of a crime at all. Forget convictions of crimes. So the idea that this is crime and punishment simply doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Now, once the initial study was, in, was done, Ida B. Wells basically begged the president of the United States at the time, a guy named William Howard Taft, to do something, to intervene in some way to stop lynching. After all, He's the chief executive of the United States. He's the person who is responsible for executing the laws of the United States. She tells him in the letter that she sends him that you can do something, even if you can't, quote, pass a law. Just you coming out against lynching and saying, I will not allow this stuff to stand. This would be a huge step in the right direction. But Taft rejected this. The president of the United States rejected this, arguing that lynching is a matter of local law enforcement and your efforts would be better spent trying to convince local officials to do something about this as opposed to the federal government because the federal government can't get involved. As a consequence of this, because of this specific action or inaction by William Howard Taft, Ida B. Wells joined with several other people within the uh, African-American civil rights movement uh, and in 1909 helped co-found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, uh, in an effort to try to fight lynching, to try to stop lynchings in the United States. Uh, now, the big question here, big question, why do lynchings occur? How do ordinary people across the South wind up taking this incredibly extreme step why are they doing this? And I think it's important to note here too that the time frame that I mentioned was 1885 to 1918. So it's not something that was going on all throughout American history, although you can argue that there, were so, there was a ton of violence in the United States racially. But lynchings themselves don't really occur until well after the Civil War. So what is going on? Why do these lynchings occur? Well, one potential issue or one potential explanation is that there was obviously, as we talked about in lecture one, a new financial order that had arisen in the South. This new financial order allowed Northern financiers and Northern financial interests to dominate the economic life of Southerners. By the 1890s, the North controlled virtually all wealth and all aspects of the financial interests that happened in the South. The second thing that we can look at is high tariffs. High tariffs wound up keeping foreign competition out of virtually, again, every industry in the United States, in steel, in railroad construction, in fertilizer, in uh, furniture making, virtually everything you can think of. If there's going to be goods coming into the United States, there's going to be an import tax put on it. And then third, something that we're not going to get to until uh, I think lecture five. Uh, so just kind of hold off uh, on the idea of what they actually are. Uh, but corporate trusts also are going to start developing uh, during this era. Businesses were banding together across the country to fix prices, to divide marketplaces up, to create as that for themselves, a stable economic environment. And again, there's a trust for virtually everything. There is a trust for oil. There's a trust for beef production. There's a cotton trust, a fertilizer trust, and on and on and on. All sorts of people across the country, in particular farmers, are stuck because they have to sell their goods at prices 
that are actually set by these corporate trusts. They can't go to market and say, well, you know, give us the best price you can. The market's already been set by these trust relationships. So they're kind of in a, in a, in a bad circumstance. Now, what do all of these things have to do with lynchings? Because I haven't really connected that dot or that series of dots, so to speak. All of these things represent a loss of control over these aspects of life for Southerners across the country, uh, especially in the South we're talking about. Uh, lynchings may have occurred all across the country, but they're concentrated in the South. And Southerners had had all measures of degree of control over their lives, over every aspect of their lives prior to the Civil War. Well, once the Civil War is over, once Reconstruction has occurred and we've got soldiers out of the South uh, who are protecting uh, the lives of African-Americans, protecting civil rights, protecting contract rights and all of that sort of stuff. Once that's gone, you know, they may, they may have gone, they may have left, but the fallout is still there for Southerners. So Southerners are going to look at this at lynching and say, well, we can't control our economic life. We can't control the prices that we get for the crops that we grow or the goods that we take to marketplace. We can't do anything about the cost of goods that are coming into the United States that would compete with American manufacturers. We have lost control over all of the most important aspects of, their, of our lives. But there's one thing that we, that quote, we Southerners can control, and it turns out to be their racial lives. Now, that's not a good answer. Nobody should finish this and take their headsets off or their earphones out and go, well, okay, I get it. Now I get why lynching occurred. We just tied a nice little bow around it. It's not, it's disgusting, but this is, you know, this is what it is. This is what the answer really is, that this is the only area that Southerners felt they had control over was their racial life. Now, earlier, I spoke about the troubles that farmers are actually having in the United States. And it's easy to, again, get this idea that Southerners are the only ones who are being hit with this problem. Farmers across the entire country are being hit by the problems uh, that farmers actually have. There was a problem of deflation that is hitting farmers dramatically after the Civil War. After the Civil War, the government, the Treasury Department, very specifically fostered deflation. Now, the government had financed the American Civil War with paper currency that was called greenbacks. Now, greenbacks and virtually all paper currency are what are called fiat currency, F-I-A-T, fiat currency, currency on demand, essentially. Literally, it's like taking a piece of paper and saying this piece of paper functions as currency. And the reason it functions as currency is because of an agreement that we basically have that this is currency. Even the paper money that you might have in your wallet, if you carry around cash, that really amounts to nothing much more than an IOU. Okay, so it's not really backed by anything other than a basic agreement that a $5 bill has $5 worth of purchasing power. Now, that currency has a value that on some weird level is affected by supply and demand. And it's a very simple type of supply and demand. If a person or if a group were to uh, put out currency and they put out a certain amount, I'm drawing some lines on the screen here, and they put out a, 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 a supply of money, it has a line that is the supply and then the value, okay? It's again, simple supply and demand. Now, if you increase the monetary supply, should be very easy to figure out that the value of it goes down, okay? The value of it goes down. But currency also has a third line to it, and that is its purchasing power. When the value of currency goes down, as noted on the screen here, the amount of 
currency that it takes to buy certain goods goes up because it has the currency has less value. It takes more of that valueless currency to buy consumer goods. Now, this circumstance where you have the currency supply increasing, the value decreasing, and thus you need more of it to buy consumer goods, the sketch that's on the screen here, that is inflation. Okay, That's an inflationary type of economy. Okay, Now, there's another type of economy that's happening. That's what's happening during the Civil War is inflation. Now, what the government wants to foster after the Civil War is deflation. They want to decrease the monetary supply. That would increase the value of the currency, and it would cause consumer prices to go down because it takes less of that currency to buy consumer goods because it has incredibly high value. Now, how do you affect this? How do you get currency out of circulation? Well, you do what the government did after the Civil War was over. They simply taxed the greenbacks out of circulation. And then once the greenbacks were gone, very simply, they the, the government just burned the greenbacks. Once they've got them at the Treasury Department, they burned them. So they can't be put back out into circulation. Now, farmers hate deflation. And think about why. It does bring consumer prices down. It brings commodities prices down. So if you're a farmer who grows corn or wheat or cotton and you go to marketplace because there's been a concerted effort to bring consumer prices down, you're going to get less money for your corn or your wheat or your cotton or tobacco or whatever. So farmers hate deflation, even though this is what the government is fostering. Southerners hate it. Uh, farmers hate it. Excuse me. Now, there are other problems that farmers have during this era that are simply unrelated to the overall economic structure of the country. There are, is a problem with railroads that farmers have. Farmers could sell to entirely new markets and could make tons of money in places that they never could have before. But remember from the last lecture, farmers have to pay much higher freight rates than they could, than they did before. So farmers, even though they have the potential to make a lot more money, they're not making that money. They're being hit incredibly hard by the freight rates that I talked about, things like JP Morgan's surcharges on Southern railroad travel and Western railroad travel. And then farmers also have a problem of isolation. Farmers lived in relative isolation. Now, every semester I talk about this stuff and somebody inevitably comes to me and says, well, you know, I know you said that, but, you know, my grandfather was a farmer and my grandfather talked about how he and his community always came together for all of these sorts of things. That's great. Those are anecdotal things. But by and large, and, I, and I'm not disputing that anybody's families had these sorts of circumstances, but by and large in the 1800s, farmers lived in relative isolation. Think about those farm plots that I talked about in the era right before the Civil War. 350 acres is the average farm size across the South. So farmers live on these big plots where they don't have a ton of neighbors around them. Also think about what farming actually is. It's a relatively independent lifestyle. It's a lifestyle where, you know, as I mentioned, it's not Farmville. You don't get a bunch of people coming in and watering your crops for you or fertilizing. You're doing everything. Okay. So it's isolating and it's an independent lifestyle. This is a totally different way of working than say Northern industrial workers would have during this era. Uh, Northern industrial workers uh, as, uh, you know, as uh, the, triangle way, uh, the triangle fire, for example, would suggest, you could put a bunch of industrial workers in a very small room and have a ton of industrial output, a ton of commodities being produced. Okay. And every single time one of those industrial workers has a bad day because they're all concentrated in the same room, everybody knows that that one worker is having a bad 
day. So they might be able to come together and say, look, you know, at the end, after the day's over, just try to get through it the best as you can. And then after the work day, you know, we'll all go out and have a beer together. Okay. That happens in the industrial workplace, but it does not happen so much in a rural farming type of community. Now, these guys may get together later and discuss things. Certainly, farmers always got together at the feed stores uh, and general stores, but they didn't get together in large numbers. They didn't unionize. They didn't mobilize together and come up with common solutions for common problems. They simply got together. They complained in these small groups and then went back to doing whatever was best uh, for them on their farms. Now, slowly, we do start to see farmers coming together. We do start to see farmers organizing politically. The first group of people who are going to do this is a group called the Patrons of Husbandry or the Granger Movement. Their primary function is a social function. They are going to try to get large numbers of farmers together to do social activities, to do something about the isolation. There's a recognition among the people who were running the Patrons of Husbandry that if you got all of these farmers together in large numbers, they would actually start talking about those problems. They realize we've all got a common enemy, whether it's the trust, whether it's the financiers, whether it's the group of people that own the agribusiness company that actually give them the loans and control the land that they're on. They'll get together, they'll realize they've got the same problem with common enemies, and they will mobilize to put together solutions for these problems. And it works. You get these guys together at barn raisings or punch socials or hoedowns or harvest festivals. And the next thing you know, they are coming up with all sorts of solutions within the patrons of husbandry or the Granger movement. They're doing things like forming cooperatives. They're putting together uh, these organizations, these legally organized businesses that are voluntarily owned and controlled by members, by the membership within that group. And they do business only with the common membership. And the work is done and the business is operated for the common benefit of those members. So it's not a corporation necessarily. It's a group of people who are together, getting together and pooling their resources together so that they don't have to go, for example, to an agribusiness corporation for a loan. They can pool their money together and create their own savings and loan and lend each other their money. So they're putting together cooperative banks. They're putting together food co-ops. They're purchasing farm equipment uh, at, cooperatively. Also that they are banding together, sharing costs, sharing risk, all of that sort of stuff. They're also going to get together and lobby their individual states to create railroad commissions. And the reason for this is very simple. They want railroad commissions created to manage railroad freight rates, to make sure that they're not getting hurt by the railroad companies. And by 1874, the Granger movement has a pretty significant number of people. There are 800,000 people who are participating within the Granger movement. However, there's a panic that hits the United States economy in 1873. And this panic led to a temporary decline in the numbers in the Granger movement. People stopped organizing. People stopped getting together in these groups. The ideas don't go away. I mean, it's much harder to get rid of an, a set of ideas than it is to get rid of a group. So the ideas don't go away. And once again, once the panic subsides by 1875, the ideas start to come up to the forefront again. And this time, it's groups like the Southern Farmers Alliance, which gets created in Lampasas County, Texas. Uh, the Southern Farmers Alliance gets created in 1875, and their main goal uh, is to fight uh, absentee land ownership. Uh, these groups of Northerners who are coming down and buying up land and then saying, well, we own it and you guys are going to farm it, but we're going to take all the profits. And by the way, we don't live in the South. We're not going to come down here. That's an absentee landowner. Groups like the Southern Farmers Alliance don't want that happening. Uh, there's also, by 1880, a parallel group called the Northwestern Farmers Alliance developing in Illinois. And again, they're carrying on these same ideas. They're talking about cooperative ownership of, uh, of 
uh, of banks. They're talking about creating food co-ops. They're talking about putting together cooperative tanneries and all sorts of other things. Again, talking about creating, uh, creating railroad commissions and the like. They are incredibly popular with farmers, both the Southern Farmers Alliance and the Northwestern Farmers Alliance. They're very popular with farmers. However, the Southern Farmers Alliance was denounced by large urban newspapers as operating, quote, counter to the principles of democracy. So a lot of people across the South who were individual family farmers, they loved the alliances, but larger corporations, urban areas, they tended to oppose the alliance movements. Now, the alliance movement looked like it might have hit its peak and been on the verge of, of starting to decline and ultimately collapse, if not for the efforts of two individuals, uh, one of whom was the guy pictured on the top of the screen, a guy named uh, C.W. McCune, Charles W. McCune. McCune had been born in Canada. He was a former dentist. He became a preacher and wound up moving to Texas in 1870. Uh, now, he tried his hand at farming in Texas and determined that this system is rigged. I'm never, ever going to be successful. And he got himself out of his debt and decided this is bad. But he also said farmers really desperately need some help. And by the early 1890s, his vision was dazzling farmers in Texas. Ultimately, three million white farmers are going to join both the Southern Farmers Alliance and the Northwestern Farmers Alliance. Now, another million people, another million farmers are going to join an auxiliary called the Colored Farmers Alliance. When the alliances were created, they continued to maintain segregation. However, ultimately, they are going to push aside segregation. I'm kind of spoiling part of the show here, but they're going to put aside segregation and they're ultimately going to unite all of the alliance movements. Now, think about what this would mean. Three million collectively in the Southern Farmers Alliance and the Northwestern Farmers Alliance, plus another million in the, quote, Colored Farmers Alliance. That's four million people. That is large enough to have made them one of the largest political groups in the United States at the moment. Now, part of how they're growing so fast is not just that McCune has some ideas, but McCune also thought that farmers ought to be organized in the same way labor unions were organized. So he pushed the alliance, for example, to start adopting uh, organizers and have professional organizers, people who go out and talk to farmers and say, look, this is what the alliance is about. Here's how you will benefit from joining the alliance. And probably the best alliance organizer there was out of all of these 40,000 people that they had was a woman named Mary Lease, who was very, she was very small. She had a kind of a shrill speaking voice, but when she would go into these uh, into these hoedowns and harvest festivals. Uh, what always happened, there would be a bunch of hay bales placed up and then some big burly farmer would lift her up onto the hay, hay bales and she'd give some variant of a speech where she'd close by telling these farmers to raise less corn and to raise more hell, to organize them, to get them all doing something to fight back against their problem. All of this is all well and good, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't work if you don't have an idea to work with. And McCune is the idea guy. While Lease is going out and telling all of these farmers, this is what's in it for you. This is why you should join an alliance. McCune winds up coming, coming up with the idea that really dazzles. And this is going to be an idea that if enacted, it would absolutely get farmers out of the crisis that they're in. Now, what this plan was, it was called the Subtreasury Plan. And I want to emphasize here that word plan. Okay, this is a plan by the Southern Farmers Alliance. This is not something that is enacted in the moment. It's not something that's even enacted while the alliance is operating. It's just a plan. Okay, what it would happen in the Subtreasury Plan. One of the things that farmers face is that they all basically grow the same crop at the same time, and they all ripen at the same time. 
They all go to market at the same time, which floods the market. They all also have debts, which means that they need to sell their crops as quickly as possible. So what winds up happening is all these desperate people wind up coming to the marketplace at the same time. They flood the market with the same crop and pff, crop prices decline. So McCune has a solution for this. What he suggested was that a federal examiner should come in and examine the farmer's crop. And we're going to use uh, round numbers here because math is not my friend. We're going to use round numbers here. If a farmer has a crop that under normal circumstances would be a crop that's worth $10,000, a federal examiner is going to look at that crop. The federal examiner will certify to the grade of the crop and say, yes, it's good. It doesn't have defects. It doesn't have, you know, it's not, you know, for cotton, for example, it's not cotton that's full of all sort, sorts of insects and parasites and all that stuff. This is good cotton. And it's worth typically $10,000. So he's going to give that farmer a certificate that says this is a good crop and it's worth $10,000. That farmer could then take that certificate to a bank and get a loan worth 80% of the value. So they could take it and say, I've got a $10,000 crop. I want to borrow $8,000. And they're going to get it at 1% interest. This is a subsidized loan. Now, since it is subsidized by the government, there's no fear of default. The bank doesn't have to worry that this farmer might screw this up and they're not going to get paid. The bank is going to get paid no matter what. Okay. So the farmer can borrow four-fifths of the value. The bank is protected. The farmer now has money in their hands. They can go off and they can pay all of their debts to their agribusiness corporation. But now what do you do with the crop? Well, the farmer could theoretically sell the crop, which they're entitled to do because they own the crop, or they could put it in one of the storage facilities that the government would also build as part of the sub-treasury plan. Now, are they going to have to pay to do this? Sure, they're going to have to pay to store their crop. They're going to pay a nominal fee. But the important thing is they've got a, essentially a bridge loan, plus they still have their crop so they can wait out the short-term price declines the short-term problems in the marketplace, just like the big agribusiness corporation that owns their land does, okay? So they can wait that out. They can sell the crop when the price is more advantageous, when it's favorable to them. And then there you have it. The next thing you know, these farmers have a pathway out of their debt. Now, the farmers and people in the alliance love this plan. This is a great idea. But you can probably figure out that the people who were landowners, the agribusiness corporations, they do not like this plan. They look at this and say, this is terrible. But in the short term, right in this immediate moment, when the sub-treasury plan is being announced, the alliance, it explodes. All of a sudden, lots of people are joining because they can see the real benefit to joining the alliance. Now, for those of you who are looking at this, if you uh, know anybody who farms, this is basically how farm subsidies today actually work. There was no such thing as a farm subsidy in the 1870s and the 1880s. The alliance people are way ahead of their time in terms of what they're proposing uh, to do with uh, farm labor. Now, the alliance is going to wind up having just this incredible story. Uh, they started setting up again, buying and selling and credit cooperatives. Uh, they devised co-op stores, co-op banks, cotton gins, tanneries. They sold goods to each other at lower prices. This is a movement. The Alliance movement transforms itself into a movement that doesn't just benefit farmers, but it's a challenge to corporate capitalism. They're talking about creating a cooperative as opposed to corporate economy in the United States. And this idea scared a lot of people. The Atlanta Constitution, uh, which is a newspaper that's still around today, when they read what the Alliance was proposing and wanting, they said, quote, 
the threat of anarchy and communism extend to the entire South because of the direful teachings or dangerous teachings of Alliance supporters. Now, the real problem that the Alliance has is that the issues that they're facing and the issues that they're trying to address on behalf of 4 million people who have joined them, it's too big to address without getting involved in politics. They need political allies. They need redress. Now, and think about why. The only way to get the sub-treasury plan to go from a plan to actual policy is to get congressmen and senators and state legislatures to actually vote for something like this. And they know that's not going to happen. The reason they know is because in the South, members of the alliance has tried working through the Democrats and it didn't work. The Dem Democrats rejected them. In the North, they tried working with both Republicans and Democrats. And ultimately, the Northwestern Farmers Alliance concluded that both parties are corrupt. We don't want anything to do with them. And we're just going to have to do this on our own. So in 1892, in St. Louis, Missouri, the alliances had this big general meeting. And what they agreed to do is to merge all of the alliances. And when I say all of the alliances, I mean they're merging the Southern Farmers Alliance, the Northwestern Farmers Alliance, and the so-called Colored Farmers Alliance. There will be one big alliance now. And to celebrate this, they're going to change the name. It's not going to be the alliance anymore. It's going to be the People's Party or the Populist Party. And again, 4 million members strong within the Populist Party. Now, they're also going to call for a national convention in 1892. And they say, in 1892, we're going to have our national convention in Omaha, Nebraska. And this when they meet in Omaha, their job is to come up with a platform to say, this is what, if you're going to run for political office as a member of the populist party, these are the things you're going to have to support. And this idea becomes known as the Omaha platform. These are things that are going to be designed to say, this is what, if you're going to run as a, as a member of the populist party, these are the things you have to support. And here's the basic ideas that we believe in. Now, the Omaha platform is also a recognition that in order to actually have some sway over politics, to actually have politics working here, people have to, the, the populists have to appeal beyond just farm laborers. Now, if you look at this Omaha platform, right it down the center, there's obviously the agenda of the farmers, the people who make up the bulk of the movement. They want currency and fiscal reform. They want the United States government to get involved in the economy to do things like, for example, put more money into circulation to bring uh, inflation up. They want a graduated income tax to shift the burden to wealthier people so that if you make more money, you pay more taxes. They want the sub-treasury plan put in place, obviously. And they also want increased taxes on land speculation to keep people from coming down to the South, buying up all of the land, and then flipping it to developers and making a ton of money. They don't, they don't want that. That doesn't benefit the bulk of the people in the South or in all of these other farming and agricultural areas. So farmers have their very specific agenda. It's catered to in the Omaha platform. But the people at Omaha realized we've got a natural ally in industrial labor. We want industrial laborers to come along with us because regardless of what it is, whether it's agricultural, whether it's industrial, we're all safe suffering from the same sorts of problems. We're not getting enough money. Our basic needs are not being met. And there are also some populists who argue that the people who are causing the problems are the same for both of us. The financiers and industrialists who own manufacturing plants and steel plants and iron processing and, and textile mills in the North, they are the same people who are creating agribusiness corporations that come to the South and buy up all the land and lay down all the railroad track that is screwing over these farmers. So they've got a common enemy, they argue. So to bring industrial labor into the fold, 
they support the creation of an eight hour workday. Now, no farmer works an eight hour workday, but they're supporting it in the platform because they know industrial labor does. They support immigration restrictions. Okay. They also support the abolition of strike breaking hiring practices, like bringing in uh, non union workers to try to stop striking workers uh, when, uh, when, a, when a legitimate strike is going on. Then they also argue that we've got to do things to appeal to the general voter populace, because even if we bring industrial labor along, we know that there are going to be people in other uh, industries, in other walks of life, who don't care one way or the other about what's going on for industrial laborers and what's going on with farm laborers. So there are things that we have to say, this will appeal to the basic general voter in the United States. So veterans pensions, for example, they say we're going to support veterans pensions. And today, this is not a radical idea that a person who serves in the United States military, if they serve for a certain period of time, they qualify for a pension because it's a profession after all. Well, a lot of people during this particular era did not believe that. They thought it was silly for a person to be a quote unquote professional soldier. So they said they don't deserve pensions. So the populists are coming out and saying, no, 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 no. If you serve, you deserve a pension. They also want the political process to be more connected to the individuals in this country. They want political reform. They want initiative where private citizens can uh, get together and propose their own laws, not wait around for the legislature to do something. They want referendums where the citizens actually vote on the laws. Again, as opposed to waiting for legislatures. And they want political primaries where everybody can actually participate, like an open primary system as we have uh, here in the state of Texas. They want direct election of the Senate. They look at the Senate and say, the world has changed, the country has changed. Having the state legislatures select our senators for us doesn't make any sense anymore. The people should determine who their senators are. And we want, they say, we want committees of experts getting together and setting economic policy or setting oil policy or setting price policies or tax policies. So they want civil service reform. They want that process to be something where we get together and say, we've got a set of standards so that if you are going to work in the Congressional Budget Office, you have an idea of how to create a budget rather than just being somebody's best friend uh, who worked in their campaign office uh, and helped them win a statewide elective office uh, in the last election. So they are absolutely trying to bring all of this together to get everybody under the same roof in a challenge, in a big challenge to corporate capitalism in the United States. Now, the populists are going to be somewhat successful, okay? Uh, now, you wouldn't know it to look at the numbers, and I'm not going to ask you to, again, I'm not going to ask you to remember the numbers. If you look at their election in 1892, they only got just over a million votes in the popular side. They also got only 22 electoral votes. They weren't even close to winning the presidency. But this was by far the most successful third-party effort in American political history to this point. So this means the election of 1896 is going to be an absolutely critical election. From an economic standpoint, it is the most pivotal election in American history. I think maybe saying just period that it's the most uh, pivotal, that eh, might be a little bit of hyperbole. But economically speaking, this is absolutely uh, a critical election in the United States. Now, the central question of the 1896 election, what is basically being fought over, if you will, is will the United States conform to the populist vision of society or would the United States wind up continuing to have a corporate capitalist economy? So is it going to be cooperatively based or corporate based? And what's going to force the United States to make this choice between 1892 and 1896 is the level of violence and the type of strikes that are going to be occurring between 1892 and 1896. For example, in 1894, we're going to see uh, a massive, uh, violent a massively violent strike in a place called Homestead, Pennsylvania, home to one of the largest steel mills in the United States at the time. The, uh, the steel mill was run by Henry Clay Frick, uh, whose number one priority at Homestead 
was to eliminate the union. He was brought in at Homestead specifically to eliminate the union, uh, the Steelworkers Union at Homestead. He began by building this enormous fence uh, around the steel mill. Uh, and it had a lot of these holes that were placed strategically in the uh, fence, which he referred to as quote unquote observation holes. Uh, a lot of the workers noted that those observation holes happened to be at the perfect height to actually uh, poke a, uh, a long arm uh, through uh, and shoot somebody if need be. Uh, and he assured them over and over again, no, 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 it's just observation and protection. Pink, uh, the next move that Frick engaged in was to bring in a group called the Pinkerton Security Agency, uh, which was known as a very brutal uh, detective agency. Uh, they were going to be brought in to provide security uh, for the steel plant. Uh, and basically, the uh, Pinkerton Agency had by that time gained a reputation as a very violent strike breaking security firm. So if a person brought in the Pinkertons, they were being brought in specifically to attack uh, the union. They were very consciously anti-union and violently anti-union. Uh, and then he did the thing that always will force workers to go out on strike so that you can engage in this attempt to break them. Frick started cutting wages at the Homestead plant and it worked. Once the wage cuts happened, the steel workers at Homestead wound up going out on strike. Now, when this happened, the next goal that Frick had was to provoke these workers. They are out on strike, which is not necessarily violent, but Frick goes out and hires what are called scab workers. These are non-union workers who will cross the picket line and continue to work in the steel mill. Now, he hires them. And it becomes clear why this fence was being built around the steel mill. If you bring in these types of workers, the workers on strike know that the only way to break management is to go in and drag the scab workers out of the factory. Well, now you've got this big wall built around it. You've also got this incredibly brutal security agency providing security. The strikers realize the whole plan here was to protect the steel mill from us, provoke us to go on strike, and then protect the mill from, quote, us. Now, what Frick and the Pinkertons didn't count on uh, was the surprising ability uh, of the steel workers to go out and engage uh, in, uh, in violence right back at the Pinkertons. For example, uh, as, this, uh, as they clashed, uh, somehow the strikers managed to obtain an old Civil War era cannon, which really scared the daylights out of the Pinkerton uh, agents. The uh, workers also set, uh, set a barge on fire and sent it downriver on a collision course with the Homestead steel plant, which, you know, if it had actually gotten there, if it had actually made contact with the plant, it would have blown up the plant. It was really nasty. Uh, so everybody is there's not just a clash of ideas. There's a physical and violent clash at Homestead. And Henry Clay Frick wound up resorting to the last card that he had. Uh, he got in touch with the governor of the state of Pennsylvania, and the governor declared a state of emergency at Homestead and ordered the militia in Pennsylvania out to put the striking workers down. And it, it happens. It may take several weeks to actually happen, but ultimately... The militia does put down these striking steel workers. And in the end, the steel workers union is crushed for the next 50 years. Now, the next area where we see this type of violence is in Pullman, Illinois. A guy named George Pullman, pictured on the right hand side of the screen here, uh, had invented the Pullman sleeping car, which was so popular that it became standard on virtually every passenger trains uh, train in the United States and made Pullman an incredibly wealthy person. Uh, when I say it's standard, I mean that every single passenger train in the United States has Pullman sleeping cars. Uh, and it's worth pointing out here that a lot of uh, commercial trains actually have these cars too. Uh, Pullman made commercial train, commercial train cars. He made beverage cars. He made sleeping cars, all of these sorts of things. And all of these things wound up on the cars, uh, excuse me, on the trains of the United States. Uh, now, he also, in addition to becoming incredibly wealthy, 
Pullman decided he was going to open up a factory to build these cars himself rather than farming this out to other manufacturers. And he's going to create a town around it. This was common during this era to create a, a, a factory and then to create a company town around the factory. And since the factory is the Pullman sleeping car company, the, ta the factory town is Pullman, Illinois. Now in Pullman, Illinois, what's going to, what workers are going to see is they're going to have schools. There are going, there's going to be housing provided there, uh, not given to them. They're still going to have to pay rents, but there's housing in Pullman, Illinois. There are stores that they can shop in all of this sort of stuff. And there's only one ironclad rule that Pullman had for his workers was all of this stuff is quote yours. As long as you don't unionize, you cannot under any circumstances unionize. Now this kind of handicaps these laborers because now Pullman is free to do whatever he wants. And these workers cannot go out on a legitimate strike. Now, as long as everything's going well and things are going well in the early 1890s, this is fine for laborers. But once again, the United States winds up having a panic, an economic downturn in 1893. And that downturn was really, really nasty. Over a several week period, Pullman, can, Pullman cut his workers' wages Every single week, every single pay period, he cut their wages until finally those wage cuts reached a total of 25%. Now, that's, that's one thing, to lower the wages, to say, look, we're not bringing as much money in, so we don't have as much money to spend, so we have to cut wages. That's one thing. But what Pullman did not add to that was he didn't cut rents for these people, and, no, and he also didn't cut prices in the company stores. So these people's cost of living is absolutely the same, but their employer is cutting their wages. And since the employer controls all of these things, these workers at Pullman said, this is patently unfair. Now, because of that, ultimately, Pullman's workers wound up going on strike. Now, remember I mentioned, since there is no union, this is not a quote unquote legitimate strike in this from the standpoint of they don't have a union who can come in and say, look, here is where you violated the contract. So we're walking out until you live up to the contract. Pullman is legally entitled to say, well, I'm sorry you disagree with my policies, but work begins at eight. If you're not here at eight, you're fired. And that's the tact that he takes with these striking workers. And it looks like they're going to lose. It looks like they're about to lose all of this until a group called the American Railway Union steps in. Now, the American Railway Union, their contract, they're not, they haven't been violated. Their contract hasn't been violated. They don't work for Pullman in any way. They're not associated with Pullman. They're the guys who are, they make up the baggage handlers on trains. They make up the guys uh, who shovel coal in the train to keep it uh, to keep it moving, the engineers, the conductors, all of these people are part of this group called the American Railway Union. Now, they can't go out on strike, but what they do decide is we are going to boycott any train that has a Pullman car on it. Now, since I told you a few moments ago that Pullman makes virtually all of the train cars and virtually every passenger train in the United States has Pullman sleeping cars and baggage cars and uh, food cars and food and beverage cars and all that stuff. This grinds railroad traffic in the United States to a complete halt. It's just done. It stops. So there's real trouble in the United States. And on top of that, violence begins escalating in the Pullman strike as well. Now, ultimately, what Pullman does is he relies on his friends. He's got better friends than guys like Henry Clay Frick, for example, who relied on a state governor. Pullman was friends with the president of the United States, Grover Cleveland. And he, uh, Pullman, begged Cleveland to get involved in this strike. And ultimately what Cleveland does is Cleveland orders the United States Army to put down the strike on the basis that trains delivered the United States mail, 
Therefore, the striking workers, the boycotters, all these people who were stopping the trains from moving, they are interfering with the business of the federal government. So the army has the absolute right to come in. And they do. The army comes in and they declare martial law in various uh, railroad hubs across the country. The one that you see on the screen here is the United States Army taking control in Los Angeles, California, and it kills this strike of the Pullman workers and the boycott of uh, the American Railway Union. Now, just how bad was this depression for these people to get to this point? I already mentioned to you that Pullman's workers, their wages were being cut by 25% total. But here's how bad this panic actually was. People today, this is being recorded in early 2022, this lecture is, People are angry today that our unemployment rate right now is right around 4%. So imagine a moment in American society where unemployment just skyrockets to above 20%. That's what's going on in 1893. What had caused it uh, was a buyback program that European governments were engaging in. They just didn't trust the United States economy. So they started redeeming bonds for gold and gold reserves in the United States started to dwindle. So the United States re uh, restricted uh, gold redemption, and this caused a massive problem in the national economy. Layoffs skyrocketed, unemployment skyrocketed, uh, workers responded overwhelmingly with strikes and with violence. Just look at the year 1894. In 1894 alone, there were 1,300 labor strikes in the United States. So Americans were clearly demanding answers and they were demanding action. And in some cases, in addition to things like labor strikes, they took some real direct action uh, as Americans did uh, with something called Coxey's Army. It was called Coxey's Army. It was uh, actually an quote unquote army of the poor. Uh, these were poor people. These were unemployed people who were marching toward Washington, D.C. They're coming from the interior parts of the United States and marching on Washington, D.C. to demand that the federal government actually do something about the economic crisis. Now, the something that they actually wanted was a public works program. They wanted the government to spend money on creating jobs so that they could put money in the hands of these people so that these people could consume and then it would get the economy rolling again. However, the government rejected this. This is a period in American history that's called the laissez-faire period, where Americans believed that the government did not have any direct role to play in the economy, so in the role of business. So the government had to stay out of all of this stuff. So rather than create a public works program, when an Ohio congressman named Jacob Coxey led these people to uh, Washington, D.C., the government responded with mass jailings because what they heard was that this rumor uh, of a revolutionary force coming into Washington, D.C., that these people who were bent on violence were coming to Washington, D.C. So they refused to, uh, officials refused to meet with them, and the government responds with jailing large numbers of people. Now, it's in this context that the election of 1896 is actually going to occur. And there's going to be a real crisis point uh, in the United States. The president of the United States, I mentioned his name before, Grover Cleveland, he was talking about running for re-election. Uh, however, the populist party had wound up taking control of the Democratic Party in South Carolina. And at the national convention, they referred to the president, Grover Cleveland, as quote unquote, a Judas. Now think about that. They're comparing him to the person, literally comparing him to the person who betrayed Jesus Christ. Now, whether you believe in Jesus or not, that's each one of your individual decisions, but you cannot deny that that is a, cr a pretty incredible insult to lay on somebody, that they are that bad of a person. Now, ultimately the Democratic Party refused to nominate Grover Cleveland for re-election, and they wound up nominating a guy named William Jennings Bryan, who's pictured on the screen here. Now, part of the issue, as the populists saw it, was that only the government could fix the economy. The government needed to engage in some 
big, broad-based program to fix the economy. And since William Jennings Bryan had enough similarities with their own ideas, the Populist Party also nominated William Jennings Bryan as their presidential candidate. Now, Bryan had created or proposed an idea called the Free Silver Program. What he planned here, what the thought was, is that the United States absolutely needed to engage in an inflationary circumstance. The only way you're going to do that, you have to create more money, but we don't want to do paper money. We don't want to have a bunch of worthless paper. What we need is hard currency backed by something, some measurable commodity. There's tons of silver that has not been pulled out of the ground or out of the mountains in the West. So what Brian says is, is we'll back our money with silver and gold, he calls it bimetallism. We'll coin a ton of money in silver. It'll create mining jobs. It'll create the inflationary economy that will stimulate the economy. Everything will work. This is what we want. So populists heard this free silver program and said, this is really close to what we want. He's close enough on all of these other things. We'll nominate him. So Brian goes out. He's got the job. He's got the nomination. And he goes out and gives this speech across all sorts of uh, areas in the country saying that this is what we're going to do if we if we get elected president. And this is Again, a huge rhetorical flourish. It's called the Cross of Gold speech. L just listen to what uh, Brian actually says. He says, they say bimetallism, gold and silver coinage. Bimetallism is good, but that we cannot have it until other nations help us. We reply that instead of having a gold standard because England has, we will restore bimetallism and then let England have bimetallism because the United States has it. So he's kind of appealing to Americans to this idea of Americans, uh, American sense of individuality, our sense that we are different, that we are unique in the world. Then he says, if they dare to come out in the open and defend the gold standards as a good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost having behind us the producing masses of the nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Now, again, imagery and rhetoric is really important here. The Democrats in South Carolina and the populists had called the president of the United States Judas. And Brian is comparing the average American citizen to Jesus Christ himself and saying that all of you big moneyed interests are crucifying, quote, us on this cross of gold. This is incredibly powerful. And he gives some version of this speech 900 times over the course of the presidential election cycle. Now, the Republicans have a different candidate. The Republicans candidate is a guy named William McKinley, pictured on the screen here. Uh, he doesn't do what Brian did. Uh, McKinley basically refused to leave home. The short story is, is that his wife had suffered a nervous breakdown. And as much as he wanted to be president of the United States, he said, well, I'm not leaving my wife. So you're gonna have to figure out a way if you want to nominate me, you're going to have to figure out a way to bring the people to me. So railroads got together and they built a spur line out to his home in Warren, Ohio. And he would and they would sponsor these massive campaign get togethers where basically they'd have a big barbecue at William McKinley's. McKinley would come out on the veranda of his house, give a speech, wave to the crowd, and then everybody gets back on the trains and off they go. What McKinley's campaign promise was was, quote, an honest dollar and a full dinner pail. He says, you can always count on the value of the American dollar because we're not going to devalue it. And he says, I promise that we're all going to have plenty. There's plenty of stuff in this country, and we will all have plenty. So you've got the honest dollar and the full dinner pail versus this cross of gold. And ultimately, when the election winds up happening, the full dinner pail won 
and won overwhelmingly. And the reason for this is actually very simple. The Republican Party and people like McKinley who saw the world as he saw it, they dominated in the upper Midwest. They dominated the eastern parts of the United States where the financial interests were. The populists and the, uh, and the Democrats who supported Bryan, they dominated in the South and the West, but they just didn't have the electoral votes to beat McKinley because of the concentration of people in the upper Midwest and in the East. So the largest challenge in American history to corporate capitalism had been defeated and defeated overwhelmingly. Now, the obituary for populism actually came a few years later, and it was in the uh, form of a set of stories written by a man named L. Frank Baum. L. Frank Baum wrote a series of stories for his children about a girl from Kansas. Uh, Kansas was the quintessential populist locale, and that young girl was taken away from that dreary place in Kansas via a cyclone, which represented populist victory. She landed in this beautiful, rich place called Oz. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie, there's an obvious moment here where the world goes from dreary black and white sepia tones to an explosion of color. She lands in Oz. When she gets there, she kills the wicked witch of the East, freeing the little people. Both of those are allegories for Eastern financiers and the freeing of the average American man, of the average American citizen from these evil financiers. In order to get home, she is told she has to go see the wizard in the Emerald City. The Emerald City is green, the color of money. She has to follow the yellow brick road, the color of gold, while wearing in the books, she's wearing silver slippers, the absolute representation of the populist journey. Her companions in this, this, uh, this walk to the Emerald City, she's got the scarecrow who represented farmers, She's got the Tin Woodsman, who represented industrial workers, and she's got the Cowardly Lion, who represented fearful reformers and reformers who simply weren't willing to do enough. Uh, some historians have suggested that William Jennings Bryan himself was, the, uh, was who the lion was meant to represent. When Dorothy gets to the, uh, to the Emerald City, she realizes that the wizard is a fraud, that he doesn't have the powers that she thought he had, or that she had been told that he had. Uh, and he says, but he tells her, I know how to get you home and I'll help you get home. If you kill the wicked witch of the West, the wicked witch of the West represented those absentee landowners, these people who owned all of this land and owned mortgages and all of this stuff. And if you've seen the movie or read the books, you know that Dorothy uh, kills the wicked witch of the West by dumping water on her. She liquidates the Wicked Witch of the West. The book is not so much a fantasy for little children as it is a political commentary on what might have been in the United States. All right, that is going to close us out for this particular session. Uh, when we come back for lecture number three, uh, we're going to see uh, some of the other things that are going on in the United States in the 1890s and how the United States transforms into the modern nation that it actually is. So see you next time.